The world is facing a global plastic crisis. Plastic pollution threatens both biodiversity and human health. La pollution plastique est une crise planétaire aux conséquences dévastatrices sur la biodiversité, sur le climat et pour notre santé. Almost 13 million tons of plastic enters the ocean every single year, affecting two-thirds of marine mammals, half the world's seabird species. La contamination por plásticos tiene un impacto devastador en la naturaleza y afecta desproporcionadamente a los países en desarrollo. In the coming decades, plastic production is expected to double. Plastic waste in nature is predicted to more than triple, and plastic in the ocean will increase by a factor of four. This spring, the world came together in Nairobi, Kenya, at the 5th UN Environmental Assembly and agreed that we have to start the long work of ending plastic pollution. For that reason, Rwanda and Norway jointly agreed to invite countries to set up a high ambition coalition to end plastic pollution. Let's put an end to plastic pollution together. Eradiquer la pollution plastique d'ici 2040. To end plastic pollution by 2040. The High Ambition Coalition is committed to urgent action through an international legally binding treaty. An agreement which ensures that plastic is produced, consumed, reused and recycled sustainably. That encompasses the whole life cycle of plastics, including microplastics. 350,000 chemicals present in different manufactured products, including plastics. À peine 10% des plastiques sont recyclés dans le monde. La pollution plastique est un problème planétaire qui nécessite une transition mondiale vers une économie circulaire sans déchets dans ce domaine. Un problème est que ça a aussi le belia complexe pour les organismes qui ont pour le bas. Quel autre plastique est prévention? Plastic is not cheap, it's smart, it's not a better system. We must reduce plastic consumption and production to sustainable levels. Make sure that the plastic that we still use will actually be recycled and used again and again and again. Only by working together, we can solve this challenge. We look forward to your engagement and support. For a world free of plastic pollution by 2040. Rwanda and Norway invite ambitious nations to join the coalition and be part of the historic mission to end plastic pollution. Dear colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this side event organized by the High Ambition Coalition to End Plastic Pollution here at the 77th session of the UN General Assembly. My name is Magnus Lobo and I will, to the best of my abilities, uh, take you through today's uh, event. I hope you can all hear me all right. We have a really fantastic group of speakers with us today who have all kindly agreed to share their wisdom with us. I think it's clear that we are at an extremely important juncture in global environmental governance. In a few months, as you all know, uh, negotiations of a new treaty on plastic pollution will kick up in Uruguay. Now, plastic pollution is an urgent and fairly complex issue, and in negotiating a treaty that will effectively solve this problem will be a challenging task. This makes it all the more important now a few months before the negotiations will begin to be clear about what we're aiming to achieve with this new treaty, when we will achieve it and how. And it's therefore fitting that the title of today's event is Roadmap to End Plastic Pollution by 2040. That gives us at least an indication of the expected timeline. Over the next 19 minutes, we will help by our great speakers try to detail what such a roadmap may look like. Without further ado, I'm pleased to give the floor first to one of the co-chairs of the High Ambition Coalition, Espen Bart Eide. He is, as many of you know, the Minister of Climate and Environment of Norway. Please, Minister Eide, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Magnus, and uh, good morning to you all. It's great to be here. I am sitting here with my good friend and colleague, uh, Minister Mujava Maria uh, from Rwanda because as you know, the very morning after uh, we uh, 
gavelled the uh, mandate uh, at uh, in Nairobi at UNEA Five. We, uh, the two of us, uh, gathered uh, a group of countries to uh, set up uh, a high ambition coalition to end plastic pollution. So we now have a formal negotiating process, which is uh, underway. And I know a lot of people who are on this call are either politically responsible for or directly engaged in negotiations. And I, I think we also have a lot of people who are engaged uh, in this in many other forms as well. Uh, and we, we thought it would be a, a really good idea to now have this uh, uh, virtual seminar to discuss uh, where we are and where we are heading and to present uh, a few more ideas about what the High Ambition Coalition can do to inspire this uh, intergovernmental negotiation process, which I seriously hope we will be able to conclude by the end of uh, 2024. And uh, I will start by uh, reminding everybody that we got a very solid mandate out of um, UNEA 5. The mandate is uh, clear on uh, the fact that we want to focus on plastic uh, throughout the life cycle, meaning how plastic is uh, produced, what it contains, how we can make uh, plastic products um, where we still need them, uh, uh, recyclable, uh, we also can foster a culture of uh, uh, reduce, reuse and recycle, have uh, good systems for collection so that we don't dump the plastic on um, landfills or uh, incinerate them, but use them again. And that also uh, speaks to the composition of plastic products in the first place. And then uh, with the uh, clear and stated ambition of actually ending plastic pollution by 2040. That's quite an ambitious goal. I mean, uh, in principle, I'd like to stop it tomorrow, but uh, given the, uh, you know, given the amount of plastics that are used uh, throughout the world, I think this is an, as an ambitious a goal as we can as we can get. And I have to say that uh, many of our uh, partners and friends in the in civil society and in the business sector are, are telling me that uh, the mandate from UNEA is already understood. People are already working to change their habits, to change their production cycles, to, to start preparing for a world where this is better regulated than it has been today. So the very signal of moving towards something has already been picked up and, and a number of companies who are either producers of or consumers or users of plastic in containers, for instance, packaging and so on are starting to deal with this. So there's quite a good momentum around this. But um, as always, I... Um, I, I feel that it is essential that politics is driven by science and insights and that we have uh, good uh, scientific uh, evidence of what, uh, what are best practices, what are the things that need to be regulated, what's it, what is it actually that we want to put into this treaty. So we as the co-chairs of the High Ambition Coalition has put a lot of emphasis on getting uh, a solid scientific basis. Uh, we do know uh, the problem of plastics. We know that plastics are in the highest oceans and the deepest sea. And uh, as I told uh, you, I even tested my own blood and I found traces both of phthalates uh, and, and my, uh, nanoplastics in my own blood. And if I have it, you probably all have it because we're exposed to this all over the place. And it's a challenge to both the environment and human health if we don't deal with it. So it's really a worthwhile effort. And I think it can be done. It is not easy. But I do believe that it can be done. And in order to do that, we want to gather all those forces and all those countries and all those businesses and all those NGOs and everyone who has taken a strong stance and try to move from agreeing that something should be done to agree on exactly what should be done. For instance, we say legally binding, but what is it that we want to have legally binding? So what, what is to be regulated at the global level and what is uh, left you know for uh, national action plans for instance what is the right balance this is not easy i mean we we have to identify what are so the common goals and then how is this implemented how do we uh, fact, um, cater for the fact that different countries have different starting points, for instance, different uh, technical capabilities. How do we help each other? How do we build capacity where there is none or where there is little? These are all issues that we have to discuss. But what, what we are adamant, uh, uh, Minister Shandak, Mujama Maria and I, uh, is that we want to keep the spirit of Nairobi throughout the negotiations. We want an outcome 
uh, which uh, reflects on the very strong mandate. And those of you who were in Nairobi or maybe followed Nairobi online will remember that while in many international negotiations, we the 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 text is being is weakened towards the final conclusion. Here was the other way around. We actually ended up with something which was probably stronger than uh, than some of the proposals. And it was uh, I would like to recognize Rwanda and Peru for having the, the the draft that actually formed the basis for the final solution. And that was by all means the most ambitious of the different draft proposals. So so that's a very good starting point. But it's just the mandate. Now the work really begins. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I would emphasize this um, need for a solid scientific basis. And OECD and others uh, will work with us on that. World Economic Forum and others will help us to connect to the business world. And uh, the WWF and others are also sort of solid coordinators of the uh, of the civil society work that is also needed to, because this is not only about rules and regulations at state level, it's also about uh, habits and understanding and societal uh, participation in this process. So with those few words, I, I, I hope for a very good seminar and I think we go back to you, Magnus. Brilliant, thank you so very much indeed for that, Minister, for that introduction. Thanks also for the, for the leadership you all witnessed during um, your time as president of the last UN Environment Assembly. That kind of leadership, I think it's clear, will, will be needed also throughout the negotiations uh, of the new, new treaty as well. Um, I'm now pleased to uh, welcome another key leader in our collective efforts to combat plastic pollution, Inger Andersen. She's UN Under Secretary General and Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, UNEP. Please, Inger, you have the floor for some introductory remarks. Thank you very much and good morning to all. Um, look, um, ministers, thank you for your leadership. We needed it all the way through. And uh, as we're seeing also uh, in the Biodiversity Convention, we need you to tell your negotiators the kind of leadership you want to show. Um, sometimes, and not infrequently, in these negotiations, we see the deep schism between the proclamation and the actual work at the negotiating level. Thank you for the leadership that you showed at UNEA. We would not have arrived without it, and we're very, very grateful. We just heard from Minister Espen Aide that you know, we have to transform into circularity, that we have to base this on science, that we need to involve all stakeholders, and that there are real opportunities for a new plastics economy. And that we, and I will add uh, to that list, which I completely endorse, but I want to be fast here and not go over the same stuff, that we need to learn from other multilateral environmental treaties and then innovate. So we, we need to take a little bit of a pinch of Montreal Protocol at the determination of the 1.5, stir in the goodwill of inclusion of the CBD, but then come up with something innovative, smart, measurable, and transparent and inclusive that pushes the boundaries of multilateral innovation and shows the world that in 2022, when we decided to do this, we were not say, doing our grandfather's treaty, we are doing our children's treaty. And that means innovation and that means smarts. And so in that respect, I am very much wanting to challenge us all to think about targets already now. Look, back in Rio, we agreed at UNFCCC uh, on a, a framework convention, a framework convention because we couldn't agree on the nitty gritty and maybe we didn't quite have the science clear. And so we said, well, all the detail will come in protocol subsequently. Well, 21 years later, a child is born and turns 21, and then we agreed on some targets. For this one, we just cannot do that. And so I ask, and actually I implore that you think about this. And in other treaties where we have scores and scores of targets, we know that that brings great difficulty. Look, when we agreed at 1.5, we didn't get a target for ocean warming. We didn't get a target for how many new windmills. We didn't get a target uh, for um, ocean acidification or from reforestation. But we agreed on some sort of simple way that would signal to the rest actions they could take. Now, I'm not saying that there's only one target, but I am saying there's less than five, preferably three. Uh, because the point is, the more complex you made, make it, the less measurable. And in that context, I think that there are three areas that negotiators and ministers and decision makers may wish to look at in this space. One is clearly 
how much raw polymer do we have in the production, right? Second is how much are we recycling? The percentage of stuff. And third, of course, uh, how much is going into the environment? But only dealing with the end of pipe in a sort of visionary statement is not gonna work. We've been there before. We all want to live in harmony with nature. We all want to live in a pollution free world. We all want to live in a non climate changing world, but it is the nitty gritty by which businesses can measure themselves that will actually get to work. And so when we think this way, it's very useful for negotiators and decision makers to think about this fragmentation, sorry, the stratification of the entire production chain, the entire life cycle. Think about the raw polymer producers, invite them inside the tent and ask them to come with solutions for more circularity content. That's step, step one. Think about the converters, those who make the plastic noodles, the plastic pellets that we all need for our plastic stuff challenge them to have more recycled content. And of course, be clear and declare around chemicals that go into that content. Think about the brands. They decide what, what specifications they need, how light, how heavy, uh, how dense the chemicals, the shape. Think about that uh, business too. Think about the packaging. While we think often about the bottle, we have to think beyond the bottle in all things plastic. And that includes trade, trade across the oceans, trade in large containers, the headroom, the empty headroom in a container that we pack with plastic. These kind of things we need to be aware of. So challenge the package in the packaging industry. And of course, the recyclers. Um, and here we have to have an honest conversation about the absence of uh, municipal solid waste infrastructure in many developing countries. And so support and push multilateral development banks and investors to invest in uh, solid waste management and waste separation. And of course, with recycling at the side. And finally, think about the consumer and educate the consumer so that the consumer will be aware of the choices that she makes. Look, money makes the world go round. So we also have to think about extended producer responsibility and deposit schemes at the global level, at a some, some level, so that a small island country that will always import more plastic than they export will have a way to send it back because maybe we have constrained the new role and maybe then the, the recycled content is uh, in demand. Right now, all the wonderful businesses and CEOs that I have been speaking with over these last five, six months, and I think I've spoken with pretty much everyone who are leaning in, they want to find solutions. But the problem is that they can't get the recycled content because of the solid waste stream that is broken. So that's what I wanted to say this morning. I really look forward to our discussion. The first INC will be in Uruguay. We're very grateful to Uruguay for hosting. That is in November, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Roll up your sleeves and instruct your, your negotiators to be ambitious. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so very much for, for those inspiring words of introduction, Inger, and, and those, those clear recommendations, I'm also sure, are all well received. And I think we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of them uh, in, the, in the panel discussion later on uh, today. Uh, now, a moment that I have been personally look at, looking uh, forward to. It is my great pleasure to invite you all to watch a special video appearance by UNEP Goodwill Ambassador, actor and Aquaman, Jason Momoa. Aloha, my kako. Mahalo to the co-chairs of the coalition, Honorable Dr. Jean Diak Majuwa Maria, Minister of Environment of the Republic of Rwanda, and Honorable Espen Barthide, Minister of Climate and Environment of Norway, for their kind invitation to speak on the importance of ending single-use plastic. It is my honor to be a part of the 77th convening of the UN General Assembly and this high ambition coalition. I am joining you virtually as I am home in Hawaii, Ne, filming my new series. My career is acting, storytelling, but my passion is saving the planet and working towards a better tomorrow for my babies, our children, and the future generations. That's what brings me here today. As the UNIP's advocate for life below water, I'm committed to helping protect and preserve our ocean on and off screen. 
Born in Hawaii, I was raised knowing the beauty and importance of one of the Earth's most vital resources. And I'm tired of seeing plastic bottles everywhere and ultimately ending up in our beautiful and polluting our planet. We cannot end single-use plastic overnight, but we can not agree to do better. We must listen and learn from one another and make changes, big or small, to benefit our beautiful planet. I will continue to use my platform to encourage industries, businesses, and governments to implement positive change. Who better to hold these sectors accountable for their actions than Aquaman? All right. The recent and historic resolution to end plastic pollution, including in the marine environment, provides the framework to change course and fast. We don't have to be perfect, but we must give it our all. This high ambition coalition can lead the charge for a better tomorrow, and together we can end plastic pollution by 2040. Now let's get it together. We just gotta get to work. Mahalo Nui Loa, thank you for listening. Aloha. Isn't he great? I think we greatly appreciate UNIPS and, and Jason Momoa's efforts to raise global awareness of the problem of plastic pollution. It's clear that while it's important to keep governments and businesses accountable, uh, we also need a full and active mobilization of citizens uh, around the world. And, and Jason's efforts are absolutely crucial in, in this respect. So thank you so much for that. Now, the purpose of today's event is to figure out how to end plastic pollution by 2040 and what we need to do to get there. I'm therefore pleased to introduce next two key experts who are each behind groundbreaking reports on the problem of plastic pollution. Uh, first, I give the floor to Yone Shiran. He's a partner and plastic lead at Systemic and also co-author of Breaking the Plastic Wave a report which provided a first of its kind model of the global plastic system and of plastic pollution. Yoni, uh, we are really looking forward to your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you, ministers. Thank you, Inger. It's not easy to follow Aquaman, but I will do my best. Good morning from New York, and thank you for inviting me to the launch of this High Ambition Coalition to share some of the science behind our global plastic problem. My name is Yoni Shiran. I'm a partner at Systemic, a company who works on the system changes needed to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. So why on earth did my team and I spend the last five years modeling the stocks and the flows of our plastic system and looking at all the economics and the greenhouse gases of different plastic um, solutions? For me, the journey started in my first trip to Indonesia several years ago. I remember walking on the beach and seeing plastic as far as the eye can see. The plastic was maybe 80 centimeters high. I remember seeing children playing on piles of rubbish, probably not even aware that there lies sand underneath. Many of you have been there and know exactly what I'm talking about, the awful sights the smell of decay, the difficult conversations with the local village people. It is an out of this world experience and it really makes you realize how far we have departed from nature's most basic design principles. And that inspired us together with the Pew Charitable Trusts to work on breaking the plastic wave. This was translated to multiple languages and appeared on the cover of science and at its essence, Breaking the Plastic Wave is about quantifying the economic, the environmental, and the social implications of the different strategies that we all have as a global community to address the challenge of plastic. And I'm thrilled to share with you some of our key findings today. The first is when we look at business as usual. So what will happen with no action? And the indicators here are quite gruesome, as you can see. Our research shows that plastic um, waste will double over the next two years, uh, over the next 20 years, sorry. Plastic pollution to the environment will triple over the next 20 years and plastic pollution in the ocean will quadruple, more than quadruple over the next 20 years. This 2X, 3X, 4X scenario is one that none of us wants and we cannot afford. But these are not just numbers in a chart. Behind these numbers, there are real people real humans, real impact on human health, real impact on biodiversity health, on ecosystem health. 
this is a scenario that we simply cannot afford as a society. We then looked at a number of scenarios. So as bus if business as usual is tripling plastic pollution to the ocean and to the environment over 20 years, we looked at current commitments. So here we quantified all the commitments that are being made by governments and by industries today. And what we see is that while these commitments do have an impact, it is not nearly enough. We estimate this reduction to be just 7% compared to business as usual. So the scale and the urgency of uh, ambition and of policies from governments and from industries must be elevated significantly if we are going to make progress. We then looked at a number of other scenarios. The first one being the recycling scenario. So in this one, we looked at, we asked the question, what would happen if we transitioned our global plastic system to a recycling system where we scale collection, we scale design for recycling, we scale mechanical recycling, we scale chemical recycling, we do all these things as ambitiously as we can possibly imagine them. How far does that take us? And the answer we found is that it makes a dent on plastic pollution, but it, is, it only flattens the curve. It does not solve the problem of plastic pollution. We then looked at a few other silver bullet scenarios, such as reduction substitution, collection dispose. All of these scenarios, they flatten the curve, but they do not get us to where we need to be. But I also have some good news for you today. We then looked at another scenario, which we call the system change scenario. And this scenario is the one that combines the upstream solutions of reduction and refill and reuse and better design together with the downstream uh, solutions of recycling and collection and sorting and putting these together. This is the scenario that can achieve an 82% reduction of plastic pollution in the environment relative to BAU. And the High Ambition Coalition today is challenging us to go even further and asking us what would it take to get to near zero by 2040. But at least we know we have the system change scenario to start with. And let's, let's see what that uh, would look like. What is the science behind it? This is a complicated chart. So I'm not gonna take you through all the details in the short time today. But the key message for you to take from here is we have a credible pathway to address plastic pollution. And we have it with existing technologies, existing technical solutions. We do not rely on aliens coming from Mars or going back to the Stone Age. We have the technical solutions today to address plastic pollution. And we know how this needs to break down, uh, what is the size of each of the solution and how it needs to break down in different geographies and in different plastic categories. What is missing therefore, what is stopping us is having the right policy frameworks the right business models, the right finance mechanisms. Those are the ones that are missing. Those are the ones we need to focus on. It's not a matter of insufficient technology or insufficient technical solutions. And if we were to put in place these more ambitious, these, these uh, better policies, frameworks, uh, uh, business models, and financing mechanisms, what would that do to our system? And so we looked at, first of all, to the economy. It would be better for the economy. It would save costs to governments and it would save costs to the private sector. Now, this shouldn't really come as a surprise. Uh, if we designed a good system for recycling, for example, that should be more cost effective than producing single-use plastic every time. Thinking, think of all the costs in that value chain uh, and how inefficient that system is. It should also um, uh, reuse systems. If we design them properly uh, and we scale them properly, reusing uh, a material multiple times should be more cost effective than producing a new one every single time. Now, this will definitely not be easy. It requires very high investments up front, and the benefits sometimes are down the road, but the economics are there and the models are there to achieve them. When we look at the environment, obviously plastic pollution to the ocean and to, and to the environment more broadly will decrease substantially, but also from a CO2 perspective, greenhouse gas emissions will decrease in the scenario, which shows us that addressing plastic pollution and addressing climate change can go hand in hand. There is no trade-off between the two. And importantly, we also looked at the impact on communities and specifically on livelihoods and jobs. And we see that about 700,000 new jobs can be added by the scenario, mainly in the global South. So three closing um, thoughts that I would like to leave you with. The first one is that plastic pollution is a system failure. 
plastic pollution is a system failure. This means there are no silver bullets that will solve it and incremental change will not be enough. We need to think of a coordinated system change response to this problem. And that is why I'm so excited and so hopeful by the Global Plastic Treaty that offers this opportunity for a global system change response. Second, we need an integrated approach. We need to combine the upstream solutions of reuse and refill and reducing the amount of plastic in the system together with the downstream solutions. And only that combination can work. If we focus only on recycling, we simply will not solve the problem. We cannot recycle our way out of this problem. We cannot ban our way out of this problem. We cannot substitute our way out of this problem. We need an integrated approach that includes all of these solutions. And thirdly, time is of the essence. We do not have time to waste. The nature of the beast is, the, is that the time it takes to develop the infrastructure and to roll out the policies and the consumer uh, behavior changes that are needed, these things take years. And so we have a very short window of about three to five years to take action. If we do not, the decisions we make in the next three to five years will determine how our system looks to 2040 and beyond, and we cannot afford to miss this opportunity, uh, this window of opportunity. And that means that if the treaty is, starts in 2025, uh, we cannot wait for the treaty. We need to start with ambitious action today at a global scale, and hopefully the, the treaty will just elevate our efforts, but we should not wait until 2025 to begin with action. So what is the prize of all of this? I showed you uh, how the system change scenario can uh, reduce costs to consumers, reduce costs to governments, reduce CO2, and importantly, it can also avert our nightmare scenario of having a dead ocean. But I'd also like you to take you back to this beach in Munchar in Indonesia, where a, a, a cleanup project that we did brought the children running back to the beach to play in the sand and to be children again. And that made me realize as a father that plastic pollution is not only taking away tourism and taking away employment, it is also taking away their childhood. And if nothing else, hopefully that gives us all enough reason to act quickly and with, and with, with ambition. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so very much for that excellent uh, presentation, Yoni. I think uh, the, point, uh, the points you make about the urgent need for a systems change approach to plastic pollution uh, is absolutely brilliantly put. And we will get a chance to, to, to get reactions and discuss this more in depth in the panel discussion in a minute. But before opening for, for the panelists, I'm pleased now to give the floor to another key expert in this field, Dr. Sharjul Agrawala. He's the head of uh, the Environment and Economy Integration Division at the OECD Environment Directorate. Please, Sharjul, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Magnus. Uh, distinguished ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon to all of you from Paris. Uh, and uh, in my remarks, I'll be complementing many of the insights that Yoni from Systemic presented and our conclusions go very much in the same direction, where I'll be focusing on uh, to also inform your discussions under the High Ambition Coalition is around three questions. Uh, what are the consequences of the path we are on in terms of consumption and waste generation of plastics right now? what would it take to move towards this goal of zero pollution? And here I'll be focusing much more on the economic drivers of plastic use and link to that a bit more in terms of what we need in terms of specific policies, uh, both in uh, advanced economies, but also in emerging and developing economies to bend this curve and move towards uh, eventually zero plastic pollution. And finally, I would end with a few thoughts on some of the urgent priorities that you might wish to consider as you move forward the discussions of the High Ambition Coalition. So I'm going to share my screen now. So just to start with the context, uh, plastic use has 
grown by a factor of six since 1980, and it's doubled between 2000 and 2019. In 2019, we were producing 460 million tons of plastic. What does that mean? It's the weight of 45,500 Eiffel Towers, just to put it in perspective. Now, if we look forward, and, and you can see there was a drop in plastics use as a result of the global financial crisis, and there was another drop as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But again, the COVID drop was very limited, and we are back on track to ramping up plastic consumption as we go into the future. And our projections are that there'll be a tripling of plastic use by 2060. Now, the coalition is obviously focused on 2040. So the number for 2040 is 766 million tons, according to our projections, or uh, slightly less than doubling from now. Now, if you look at the increases across all parts of the world, uh, so here I'm talking about 2060, uh, there's roughly a doubling of plastics use in most of the advanced economies. Uh, then you have India, where we are projecting an increase by a factor of five and a half. And uh, what is called other Africa, which is basically sub-Saharan and southern Africa, where we are projecting an increase by a factor of six and a half. Uh, so that's the projection that we have in terms of plastic use by 2060. Uh, but of course, we care a lot more about what are the implications of plastic waste generation? And here we project a near tripling of plastic waste generation also. So we had 353 million tons of plastic waste, which was generated in 2019. We are projecting it to go up to a billion and 14 million tons by 2060. And the number for 2040 is 615 million tons. Now, we also look at the fate of this waste we generate. Uh, a lot of it goes into formal waste management systems. Uh, it's recycled, incinerated, goes to sanitary landfills. But of course, you have a category which is what we are calling mismanaged waste, which is plastic waste, which is littered or uh, ends up in unsanitary landfills or, or being dumped or burnt in open pits. Now, this is the picture of the shares of the fate of the plastic waste in terms of percentages. And the good news is, even under business as usual, the share of recycling we are projecting would nearly double from 9% now to 17%. Uh, we project that incineration and landfilling as shares of the total waste will largely remain constant. And the share of waste that is mismanaged would decrease from 22% to 15%. So that's the good news in terms of percentages. But in absolute terms, the mismanaged waste is projected uh, to nearly double. Now, for 2040, we are projecting total waste to be around 615 million tons. But of course, for pollution, the category you care most about is the waste which is mismanaged, which is 111 million tons by 2040. Now, let, let me address this question because the ambition in uh, the, uh, for the Plastic Treaty and the High Ambition Coalition is to stop plastic pollution. A basic question is, what do we mean by plastic pollution? So if you just look at leakage of plastics to the environment, and here I'm including oceans, I'm including rivers, and I'm including land, our projections are that leakage would double from 2019 levels to 44 million tons per year by 2060. But there's a lot more to it. A lot more plastic would be mismanaged and put in illegal dump sites, or it'll be burnt in open pits. And that number is almost triple the number which is leaking. It's 115 million tons per year. Then you have the cumulative stocks of plastics which are already in our rivers and oceans. And that would be half a billion tons by 2060. Then you have greenhouse gas emissions linked to the plastics life cycle, 4.3 gigatons per year. And finally, you have a whole range of other impacts which we have quantified, which are looking at implications on land use, human toxicity, and so on and they are projected to double from 2019 levels as well. So the scope of plastic pollution is actually a lot broader than leakage into the oceans. And these are the varying orders of magnitude you have for the different dimensions of plastic pollution. But let's focus on leakage to the environment uh, for, the, for the remainder of the discussion. We also did a stock take looking at 50 countries around the world, all of the OECD membership, but also key emerging economies and uh, other uh, developing economies. And this is the map of the uh, countries we looked at. And we looked at what kind of policies do they have in place now. 
And what we found was only 13 countries have incentivizing waste sorting at source. And if you look at the percentage of population they cover, these 13 countries only cover 4% of the population of the countries we looked at. So it's a very small share of the population which is actually subject to incentivizing waste sorting at source. 25 countries have policy instruments to incentivize recycling. And again, in population terms, the share is much less. 33 of these 15 country, uh, 50 countries have regulations for extended producer responsibility. Uh, a larger number of countries have put in place bans and taxes on single-use plastics, but they cover very small waste streams. It's trying to get at the litter problem. It doesn't do much for circularity of plastics, nor does it do anything for reducing demand. And most importantly, most countries do not have adequate incentives in place to reduce plastics demand and to improve product design. And that's across the board, looking at both OECD and non-OECD countries. So that's the picture we have of the policy frameworks. That's what you're starting with as we launch the High Ambition Coalition. The, so the next question is, what would be a roadmap to get to where you want? So at the most basic level, we urgently need to close the leakage uh, pathways which are making these plastics enter our environment. And clearly investing in collection and disposal infrastructure is a very high priority. We did some cost estimates and we estimate that roughly $25 billion is needed per year for these kinds of investments in low and middle income countries. Uh, we also need to put in place bans for tax frequently littered items and some of that is already happening. But we need to go beyond that and further upstream. We need to create incentives for recycling and sorting at source. And this is where instruments like extended producer responsibility for packaging and durables, landfill and incineration taxes, deposit refund schemes, pay as you throw schemes come in. But ultimately we need to go further upstream. We need to restrain demand. The biggest impact on reducing plastic pollution is by cutting demand. And, and here bans or taxes on single use plastics are important. We need to pay attention to removing fossil fuel subsidies because a bulk of our plastics are still primary plastics which are produced from fossil waste sources. We need to regulate hazardous substances, impose recycled content standards, modulate extended producer responsibility fees because that would provide incentives for improving the design of products. So that's a roadmap that we are proposing in terms of how to get to zero pollution. Um, we also did some modeling work to simulate if we have globally coordinated ambitious action, how close can we get to eliminating leakage? And the time frame for our analysis is 2060, but I'll talk about what the implications are 2040 uh, in a minute. So on the left, you see the baseline scenario where we were using uh, almost 1100 million tons of primary plastics. And through a number of policies which we implemented in our scenario, we were able to cut down the demand for primary plastics by 60%. We were also able to more than double the share of recycled plastics uh, that was entering the economy. In terms of plastic waste, we were able to reduce plastic waste from close to a billion, million, uh, a billion, ton, a billion tons by 2060 to 680 million tons. And the biggest improvement, and that's what we were targeting, was mismanaged waste, where we were able to reduce the mismanaged waste from 153 million tons to only 6 million tons uh, in 2060. And you can see the consequences on aquatic leakage, uh, which is, uh, I would say, virtually eliminated, but not completely. Macroplastics is virtually eliminated. We still have a significant microplastic problem because we don't have enough policy tools to reduce microplastic leakage into the environment. And of course, microplastics are also generated when macroplastics break down. So that's what we found. Now, to do this, what do we need? We need to tackle the entire life cycle. We need to reduce demand. Uh, we need to increase recycling, extend the usable life of plastic products, and eliminate mismanaged waste. So that's the composition of the portfolio of instruments we had. Uh, we obviously have a lot more detail underneath uh, all this. Now, what about the costs? Now, I won't give you an image that it'll be costless or there will be benefits. There will be costs, particularly in this transition to remove the hardwiring of our economies from a linear plastic economy to moving towards this kind of scenario. But overall, we estimate that even this global ambition scenario would cost less than 1% of global GDP by 2060 in the aggregate. 
But I think it's important to look at the distributional consequences. And you can see what is called other Africa, which is sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, and, and, and Southern Africa would have GDP costs of close to 3%. So beyond the aggregate picture, we need to look at where these costs are very high and what kind of mechanisms could be put in place to, to finance uh, some of these actions which are urgently needed. So with that, I come to my final thoughts. So what would it take to eliminate plastic leakage uh, to the environment by 2040? Uh, so we need a similar roadmap. I mean, what we showed was what we did for 2060, and it really stretched our policy tools to the maximum, uh, but there's room to do more. Uh, so I would say uh, the roadmap doesn't change, but obviously we need to step on the gas even more and double the speed. In addition to that, I think if you're going for net zero pollution, then we need to also look at the stocks of plastics that are in the environment and also address the issue of uh, removal of some of those stocks, which could perhaps uh, help with a net zero goal by 2040. Uh, the second issue is that it's good to have a global picture, but we need to, uh, a lot of the plastics problem and the leakage problem is a regional problem, more than the national boundary, but much more at a regional level than a global level. We need to focus a lot more on regional hotspots uh, and, uh, and, and see what kind of policy mechanisms and cooperation mechanisms could be put in place. Another big issue in our study is rivers. We find that rivers are not just a channel for plastic flows to the ocean, but they are a big sink of plastics in and of themselves. What do we do with those stocks of plastics which are sinking in the rivers? And there needs to be international action to look at this problem. Microplastics I've already mentioned, we still know very little about microplastics flows. We don't have enough knowledge on what kind of policies we can uh, implement to reduce microplastics leakage. Innovation on the positive side is already happening. And in our report, we quantify trends in circular plastic innovation. That needs to be ramped up. But a lot of the innovation is happening in OECD countries and China. And how do we set up mechanisms for the transfer of some of these innovative technologies to scale up action is another area. And finally, distributional consequences. The costs are heterogeneous across countries, but they're also heterogeneous within economies. And as ambition ramps up, we will be confronted with winners and losers, and we need to pay more attention to, to that as these policies are designed. Uh, financing for closing leakage pathways is an urgent priority, especially for uh, low and middle income countries. And our estimates of the financing needs are $25 billion a year. And finally, I think we should not boil this problem down to a waste management or a leakage problem. Equally critical is international alignment of design and product policies, trade and circular economy policies. We've seen some bans on plastic waste, but trade can also be a vehicle to, to close the loops on reuse, remanufacture, and so on at scale. And for that, products need to travel across waters as long as we can ensure environmentally sound management of waste. How do we align trade and circular economy policies? And finally, regulation of hazardous substances across plastic value chains. We cannot close the plastics, make the plastics economy circular without cleaning the plastics value chain. With that, I thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Thanks so very much for that excellent presentation, Shadow. I think yours, your presentation and Yonu's presentation, together with the introductory remarks that we heard earlier in this session, set the stage uh, really nicely for, for a good discussion. And I'm really happy now to introduce uh, our panelists for today, who will provide us with further thoughts and perspectives on the actions and the policies and initiatives that may in some provide us with a credible roadmap for an end to plastic pollution by 2040. In addition to those that I have already introduced. We have uh, with us uh, today, Dr. Shan Dark Mushaba Maria. Uh, she's the Minister of Environmental Rwanda and also co-chair as mentioned by uh, Minister Aida of the High Ambition Coalition. We have with us uh, Stephen Gilbault. He's the Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Canada. Uh, we have with us uh, Mariam Almeiri. Uh, she's the Minister of Climate and Environment of the United Arab Emirates. We have Kristin Hughes with us, uh, the director of the Global Plastic Action Partnership at the World Economic Forum. And last but far from least, we have Craig Kogut uh, with us. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO of Pegasus Capital Advisors. So this is a fairly impressive panel, I would say, and I would like to thank all of you for, for being with us today. If I may first turn to you, uh, Minister Gilbault. Having just listened to Ioni's and Charles' excellent presentations, from your perspective, 
What do we really need to do to end plastic uh, pollution by 2014? What role do you think a new treaty can play in these efforts? And what are really the concrete steps that governments and businesses can take to raise ambition levels and, and ensure the success of the treaty? Thank you very much, uh, Magnus. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, to really thank uh, Jean d'Arc and, and Espen for for uh, for your leadership uh, on, on on this. Um, starting, a, I mean, way before UNEA 5.2, but really setting the course for for, for this uh, ambitious international legally binding treaty. And uh, and I'll get there in a minute. Uh, in the case of of Canada, our our, our work on, on on fighting plastic pollution um, has been has been going on for, for, for some years, certainly when we spearheaded the Ocean Plastics Charter as part of the G7 in, in, in 2018, uh, to, to start playing a facilitative role uh, to, 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 to help us launch those, uh, those international uh, negotiations. Um, we have been hard at work in, in Canada. Uh, we're, like many other countries, only recycling about 9% of plastics, so we have a long way to go. In our country, which is why we we really double down on on our work, um, including banning uh, single use harmful single use plastics. Um, Inger, you were talking earlier about challenging the private sector to to do better. Well, and we are challenging them, but we are also imposing a minimum uh, recycle contents for 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 plastic pro products in Canada, uh, establishing new labeling rules. Um, strengthening producer responsibility, and and we're doing that with working with def different levels of, of of government in 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 Canada. I think one thing we've heard from from both our our technical presentations is is the need to um, to work on on science uh, innovation, uh, but also it, it is an interesting um, plastic is very interesting. I mean, sometimes you know government have to pull. Uh, their their population along uh, on on some of these issues, certainly not the case on on, on plastics. Um, when government started intervening, um, most of my fellow Canadians already had already massively stopped stopped using uh, plastic bags. Not because governments were asking them to do it, not because companies were asking them to do it, but simply because they they, they thought uh, that it simply didn't make sense. So we we saw a 50, 60, 70 percent drop in the use of plastic bags. Uh, just as a groundswell movement by, 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 by the public, um, and and to this date, uh, the 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 announcement on banning single-use plastics in Canada uh, remains the most popular announcement that my government has made since 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 2015. So there is a lot of public support for for what we are for what we are trying to do together. Um, we were very happy to to play a, a supportive role at UNEA 5.2. As co-chair of one of the working groups, and and my message to you is, is Canada will be there to work with the international communities because individually our countries can can do great many things and and some are but clearly we've we've seen how international cooperation is is important on, on so many different levels. So we're we're there. We will continue to be there to to work with you and to ensure that we have a successful, ambitious outcome. In, um, in, in the coming two years. Thank you very much. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much for that, uh, Minister. I was also wondering if, if I could ask you, Minister Almeri, to share your reflections on this, this question. And thanks again for being with us this morning. What, in your view, broadly, should we do um, to, to end plastic pollution by 2040? What is the role of the new treaty and which concrete steps can governments and businesses take in your view? Thank you, Magnus. I also want to uh, echo uh, a, a great thank you to Minister Espen, Minister uh, Jean d'Arc. Uh, really, thank you for spearheading this really important coalition, uh, which is which is so needed. Uh, also, all the presentations have been fantastic. I've learned a lot, by the way. Um, there's so much more we can do, and. Um, I want to say here as well, the UAE is committed and we need to do a lot more um, in the UAE. I have to admit that on, on this front. Uh, and it's just interesting to see that the technical solutions are there. Uh, it's, it's about the policy framework. And, and I like what Yoni said about um, the systematic approach. I think this is so important. You know, we always talk about 
food systems transformation or energy systems transformation here we're talking about a plastic pollution system transformation um, so uh, it was really interesting to get those insights we've got this is a global challenge that needs um, a, a global solution and it needs all hands on deck and so we actually need a global roadmap and i think this treaty is exactly what is needed to to make this uh, roadmap um, it's really important, uh, as some of my colleagues already said, that we apply an all-inclusive, sustainable and circular approach. Um, and, and I think sessions like these where we, we get these insights and, and we learn what are the gaps that, that we need to actually put this approach together is so important. So I can really only say <clears throat> a circular plastics economy is really needed at this stage. Um, and um, I believe a lot of the solutions have been put on the table and it's now up to governments like myself to go back to the team and ensure that we're doing everything we can on putting the right policy frameworks, that we put our targets as well uh, to ensure that whatever we can do on a national level, we do. Um, and then, of course, have these kind of conversations uh, with the global community to ensure we're aligning with each other and we've got that big target in front of us to, to try and have uh, zero plastic pollution by 2040. So I thank you all for your insights. Brilliant. No, thanks, thanks to you, Minister. That is, that is excellent and very helpful. I would also like to, to have uh, your thoughts on this, uh, Christine. I know that the Global Plastic Action Partnership at World Economic Forum works with a range of stakeholders to translate sort of commitments to end plastic pollution into concrete action. So in your view, what are the main steps or what were the main steps in a credible roadmap, a roadmap for an end to plastic pollution by 2040B? Grant, uh, thank you so much, Magnus. And, and I also want to just first also echo my thanks uh, for Minister uh, Bartai. It's so nice to see you, Espen, again, and uh, really appreciate your leadership as well as that of Minister Amusha Maria. So nice to see you two together, um, probably in New York. So a, a very, very kind welcome there. And I also just want to recognize the enthusiasm. I mean, when you showed that opening video, we also saw Inga jump up. And uh, your, Inga, your, your enthusiasm here today is also um, very, very clear. So so appreciate everybody's uh, leadership and enthusiasm, excitement for this, and and you know massive. Uh progress as we've seen from the leadership of, of Rwanda, Peru, taking this up. And, and when you ask, what are the kinds of things we really need to see to try to get this over the line? And I think a few of these uh, themes have gone through in the other comments from some of the other speakers. So without totally um, duplicating efforts, I'll recognize and, and ditto some of those. But more than anything, I would say we need to be very ambitious. Um, this is really a chance in a lifetime. It's amazing that we're going to try to get this done in just over two years. As Espen constantly tells us, that is the blink of an eye. So we need to also really, really move quickly toward the INC. And when we're setting those ambitious targets, then we also need to be very transparent. So how do we ensure the that we're recording, we're being open on that progress. Uh, again, I think it was Espen or somebody who mentioned that not all countries will be at the same place to begin. But at the same time, if we're open and transparent about where we are, we can also then set the right kinds of targets in trying to address and uh, achieve the, the objectives. And then finally, I'd say we'd also need to be accountable. So let's set ambitious targets, but let's also ensure that we're following through. So one of the things that we do at Global Plastic Action Partnership is that we help work very closely with countries, both in bringing together multi-stakeholder dialogue. So who in the in uh, the community is already working in this space and how can we actually connect those dots and amplify for greater impact? We also, and again, a number of the speakers have called for, including uh, our fantastic uh, analysts who gave us these incredible charts, which are really quite depressing um, if we don't take immediate action. But they, we really need to set very science evidence-based targets. And again, one of the things that we do in Global Plastic Action Partnership is we help governments with those. So what does the baseline assessment look like? And then we can take that assessment and help them to deliver national action plans or roadmaps of action that will help to actually deliver concrete outcomes and address this, this change in, in very monumental ways. So, and again, I think, 
think it was uh, uh, Minister Almeri who just called for a global uh, roadmap. We work at the national level. At the same time, regional activities, global activities must be taken into account. The final two points I would say that I'd really appreciate and, and, and advocate to be included is that conversation around global trade and the transboundary movement. And how does that play a role? Obviously, we have uh, the Basel convention to take into consideration, but that will play very massively into this. And then finally, finally, uh, the role of the informal sector. I think it's really critical that we have the voice of the most vulnerable at the table to understand and recognize the role that they play in helping us to transition to a much more circular uh, plastics economy. Thanks, Magnus. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Christine. That is extremely helpful as well. I would like now to maybe circle back to the co-chairs of the High Ambition Coalition and ask the Minister uh, Mujava Maria for, to share her reflections on what she's heard so far. Please, Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, I know what me ministers uh, in Anderson, uh, all protocol observed, researchers, Thank you very much to have joined this uh, momentum, if I may say. And uh, thank you, my dear friend and the co chair. And I am I'm really convinced that we can achieve a, a world, a planet near zero plastic pollution. So uh, Rwanda is committed to continue this journey. The journey we started 18 years ago. 18 years ago, we banned uh, single plastic use, I mean, plastic carry bags. Then uh, two years ago, we banned single use plastics. And we have seen our number of visitors and the tourists doubling and tripling, not only because of the ban of plastic, but this is one of the factor that has seen the number of our tourists increasing in Rwanda and being attracted to be accommodated in a tourism industry without plastic pollution. And uh, we have seen the increase of safety on our cattle. You know, Rwanda is a cattle keeper uh, country. So we, we used to lose cattle, we used to, to have uh, erosion because the water could not penetrate. But when we burned, uh, uh, plastic carry bags, and we started collecting plastics that were in nature. Now you can see tremendous progress in our erosion control. So Rwanda is committed, as well as Norway, we are committed to make sure that this treaty comes to life. Uh, and I think the scientists that shared with us the, the science-based um, presentations, and we can really continue to, to discuss and to make sure that these discussions be a fruit for all of, for all of us, for the planet, if really we want, as scientists told us, if we want our children to be children, if we want our future generation to be proud of us being ministers today. I thank you very much and I look forward to the results of this discussion. Brilliant. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister, for that. Uh, that is extremely helpful. I think. I'd like to try to move a little bit more into the details and some of the questions that's been raised. And, and we heard in the presentations that the production of plastic has doubled over the past 20 years, and it's expected to double again over the next two decades and triple over the next three in a business as usual scenario. And we heard some characteristics from the presenters about this. Um, and it's looked rather, rather, you know, um, 
problematic, um, to put it that way. At the same time, it was also clear that we can reduce plastic pollution by more than 80% by 2040 uh, with existing solution if we implement better policies, new business models, and innovative financing mechanisms. So the challenge here seems to be to move from a sort of business as usual scenario to a business of sustainable change uh, scenario. And I would like to bring you in here, uh, Craig, from your Point, uh, vantage points as a CEO of a major sustainable investment managing, uh, management firm. How can we incentivize these new business practices, policies and, and financial mechanisms that we need to change the business as usual trajectory? Uh, thank you all. This is, and first again, the Excellencies, um, Ministers, um, it's incredibly important, exciting what you're doing. Just two minutes of background, so um, maybe you'll understand why this is a particularly uh, sensitive topic for me. Um, we've invested both in the United States, Europe, but also in the, increasingly in the Global South, working with Systemic on a number of areas, including the, the Coral Reef Fund, with the Green Climate Fund as um, our pr principal sponsor. Um, and plastics, um, both on land and, or, and in the oceans, are a major focus. Um, with those activities, we um, invested in the United States in 2008 in the largest independent plastic recycler. So um, I, I've seen early on, I mean, relatively early, not as early as Rwanda, although I visited Kigali in 2008, and I was amazed at what you had already done, Minister. Um, but um, we've been involved in, and on the technology side and the like. So I'm, I'm it, it's an issue I've seen cleanups in the Maldives with ecotourism. Um, I've seen a lot of what works, a lot of what doesn't work. I, I, I think first, uh, you, the national, the, the treaty issue, single use plastic um, is the number one thing people need to do um, because we can do the best business models in the world, but single use plastics can't be recycled. Uh, but we, there's no good business model to deal with those. That, that starts at the government level. Um, what Yoni said about systemic approach, I think really is critical. We need everything and there'll be different business models in different places. Um, one of the lessons we early learned uh, in places like the United States is it's national government's not really relevant. State governments often are not relevant, it's municipalities. And when we think about some of the largest plastic polluters and problems, uh, countries like India, um, it's very much a state or local situation. So you need, whether it's a collection effort um, or um, a regulatory effort, um, you, you need to really work at that level. I highlight um, a recent initiative by Andhra Pradesh in India, which has tremendous promise, 50 million people. Um, it's obviously the size of, a, of a several of countries. Um, and I think we have to also think about engaging, not just regional, in some cases it'll be regional, but in some places it's within countries. In my country, I mean, you all know about the different, the multiple Americas we're now living with. And I, I think we have to focus there. Um, the, tech, the technologies do exist. I wanna reiterate that. This is mainly business models. There are alternatives and I, we shouldn't leave those out, bioplastics and the like. And I think when we think about a, systemic change. Some of it is dealing with other parts of the waste stream where we can create systems that work economically um, to create alternatives. And municipal waste is loaded with organic waste. It may have plastic waste, but that organic waste can often be a plastic solution, a plastic alternative. Um, I, so I, I think there's a role for government, but one of my messages is I think with this treaty accountability as has been mentioned, publicity, I've seen, I, I would just say I'm skeptical about the numbers, even on what has, we think is being treated. Have you been in the business? I know that often what's reported is not accurate. Um, things are not really treated as they said they are. Landfills that are supposedly preventing leaching are not really doing that. Um, so I think working governmentally to um, bring not only have uh, transparency, but um, with corporations um, pushing them to be more transparent in their reporting and use, I think is very important. Um, but from an, it, it, at the end of the day, I think it comes back to also working with the mention of communities, um, systems that work, um, 
corporations often will not do this on their own. But if consumers, as, as you mentioned, minister in Canada, uh, there was no resistance to the treaty. Um, there are organizations like Parley for the Oceans, who I mentioned, who was involved in Andhra Pradesh, who have shown tremendous consumer acceptance um, for reusing plastics and also for dealing with plastic alternatives. So I, I think it's, um, I'm rambling a little because there's so much to talk about. It's not one size fits all, but I think depending on um, where you are, um, you need to build also in an economic model um, for getting the communities to work together, whether it's supplemental income in collecting plastics, um, supplemental income in processing, and it does tie to trade. If most recycled plastic today in the yarn business largely goes to China and Taiwan, why can't it be built in India? Why can't in a factory be set up in Indonesia? Why can't a factory be set up in India? Why can't a factory be set up in Africa? And I think that's where economic incentives for localized production and collection, I think can also really make a difference and encourage it, it increase the importance of local co collection and local regulation. I could go on a lot more, so. No, no I, I understand that. <laughs> that is already uh, very, very helpful. Thank you so much for that, Craig. And I would just a bit conscious of time. And I know that the people on this call, they have busy agendas and it's a very busy week for everybody. So. I would just like to bring you back in on this as well, Minister Almeri. What can we do? I mean, touching upon some of the problems that and the challenges that, that Craig maybe outlined, what can we do to incentivize new business practices, policies, and financial mechanisms in your view? Um, I think uh, Inger said this, have these uh, consultations and discussions with all the relevant supply chain stakeholders. So. Yeah, producers, packagers, recyclers, uh, consumers to understand because as Craig said, waste is a local affair, by the way. It's the same in the UAE. We've got seven emirates and each one is handling in a different way. We have some emirates that have banned single use uh, uh, plastic bags. Others have put a fee on it and are going to soon ban it. So everyone's taking it a little bit differently. On a federal level, uh, we're now putting together an integrated waste management strategy, and this is also in, co in consultation with all the, the Emirates, um, and ensuring that, because these, these, these conversations, what's really important is to showcase the economic benefits. This is, it. unfortunately, it all comes down to, to money. So having these discussions, showcasing numbers, showing why it's worth it to uh, put in bans, why it's worth it to uh, put these tools and incentives, why it's worth it for the local Emirates to invest in a facility for recycling or um, uh, ensuring we have that circular economy approach or taking a waste stream and putting it as an added value for somewhere else um, is so important here. And I can only say in, in, in the UAE, um, I feel this is an area we haven't advanced as, as much as in other areas, and it's something we are really concretely working on right, right now and improving, and that's, that's why having a national action plan makes so much sense. We need to work on prevention, reduction, and elimination in it, and uh, ensuring that the local Emirates also understand what are the technologies available, bringing uh, private sector into it, investments, and then, of course, consumer behavior. Uh, and this is something also uh, Shardul also spoke about how important it is for awareness and showcasing what are the alternatives. Uh, Dubai, for example, have uh, it just started um, uh, a new initiative called Dubai Can. Um, basically, they have all these machines around the Emirate where you can take your um, your multi-purpose uh, um, uh, container and refill it instead of using uh, plastic bottles. So a lot of incentives are coming also from the people because they want to. It's the same as what Stephen was saying in, in Canada. Um, but um, in, in my situation, I feel there's so much more we can do as government. But the difficult part is that it is a local affair. And so you need to convince everybody. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Minister. And I know that some of you may have to leave a little bit early. So if you have to have to step out, we just want to thank you so much for your participation. Really appreciate that. Also know that um, uh, Minister Gilbo will have to leave soon. So I also wanted to just circle back to him before mm -hmm. before he, he moves on. Um, so I just wanted to touch, uh, pick up on this question about a system change that we talked quite a bit about already today. I think we know that collaboration between the private and the public sector and also collaboration between actors across the value, uh, value chain is really key to unlocking the kind of system change needed. Just wanted to turn to you before you before you step out, uh, Minister Gilbo, uh, for your reflection on uh, how we can enable more collaboration uh, between these actors to unlock the systems change needed to solve the plastics crisis. Thank you. I think it's a it's a combination of, of things. I mean, clearly, we we need to engage. We need to um, we need to consult. Um, but obviously, it can be voluntary. Um, and we, we've we've spoken about the the, the the need for regulations. We've spoken about the need for for for, for incentivizing change, either at the at the corporate, as I and others said. I, I think in, in terms of the public largely in many countries, I can't speak for others, but certainly in mine, the public is there. I guess we need a healthy uh, balance of, uh, of carrots and sticks. I, I don't think regulation in and of, it, in and of themselves are, are enough. I don't think simply incentivizing this, this sort of things we, we need. I mean, I, our colleague from the OECD was talking about um, fossil fuel subsidies. Well, Canada is in the process of elimin eliminating all of our fossil fuel subsidies. We, we've, we've committed to do that two years earlier than our G20 partners. So the, the goal for the G20 is to eliminate them by, by 2025. We're on in the process of eliminating them, them by, by, by next year. Um, so we, I, I think we have to look at everything, really. Um, both, both the things that we 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 don't want, the thing, the, the things that we want, and 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 to tackle different different aspects of this of this challenge, we need we we need different tools. But but certainly uh, there needs to be there needs to be an engagement. There needs to be a conversation. I mean, as government, we we don't have all we don't have all the answers. We we have some of them certainly. Um, and it, and it won't always be easy. I mean, right now, uh, the federal government in Canada is, is being sued by some companies, not all, um, for, for what we're doing on, on, on plastics. Uh, there are different court cases, actually, which is not unusual. We we often get sued um, for, for, for what we do on, on environmental issues. Uh, it was the case on carbon pricing. It's the case on environmental impact assessment. So you can expect that there will be resistance. And that's you know, in a, in a democracy like ours, it's 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 what it is. Uh, we we have to we have to compose with this, but it shouldn't stop our determination to to advance and to advance, as so many have said this morning, as quickly and as fast as we can. Brilliant. Thank you so so very much uh, for that, Minister Gilbo, and and thank you for your participation. If you have to have to step out of the meeting, that's that's totally fine, and just a real real uh, massive appreciation for taking the time to 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 participate and share your thoughts. That's, that's really um, very grateful for that. I'd like also to bring in. I mean, we have some some a few minutes left, um, and I would like to bring in uh, you, um, Inger, on these two aspects. The first on how to incentivize new business practices, so change business practices, and the other one is this need for collaboration to unlock systems change. I was wondering if girls have your have your thoughts on that, and then I would also very much like to hear from Kristin uh, after you. Thank you. And I think uh, Yoni is absolutely right when he speaks about the fact, and by the way, two brilliant presentations by our colleagues, so thank you. Uh, but when you speak about the fact that it is systems change, it's exactly, it's rethinking. It's not just designing with a smaller, lighter bottle or a smaller, it's actually rethinking. Today, yes, you can buy your detergent in liquid form. You could also, 20 years ago, buy it in powdered form and it worked just as well and it came in a cardboard box. Or you actually can buy a little strip, no bigger than this. It can fit in my pocket and it, I can throw it in the washing machine. It's complete rethink. Uh, Pepsi Cola has bought Soda Stream. That's thinking way beyond the bottle. It's thinking about putting bubbles in the bottle that is permanently yours. All right. So my point here is that in rethinking, there are opportunities, there are new markets, there are new 
whole new ways that brands can produce stuff. Um, now we understand that 60% or so of the global waste basket is single use. That varies obviously by jurisdiction. And 40% is so single use in any form of packaging, et cetera, and not just plastic bags and bottles, right? And the other 40% is a harder, durable, more difficult plastics, the toys, the appliances, the transport sector, and the electrical, the carpets, all of that stuff. In, so your coffee maker, when it doesn't work, we need to have a right to repair. It should not be sealed, right? So that there's something there that you should be able to have it repaired. But that's also system thinking. Um, we need to, if it is permanently broken, it needs to be easily disassembled so that the, it can be easily then remanufactured. The same for airplanes, trains, and, and cars which have considerable plastic. So the redesign story is one that should spur innovation. And the text inside this treaty needs to be careful that the, the kind of incentives that it sets doesn't limit innovation, but that it opens the floodgates for innovation. And that's why it's very important to have industry inside the tent, as well as activists and NGOs and indigenous people, because industry will be able to, well, sometimes, yes, it will defend the status quo, that's life. But also they will be able to enable that sort of seeing into what might be potentially limiting. When some countries said 10% of ethanol into the, the petrol pump, it had knock-on effects that maybe we hadn't quite thought about. So thinking through what the knock-on effects could be uh, becomes critical. That is why I hope that every minister present here, every country representative will strongly engage with industry as well as with activists and indigenous people and scientists and so on to encourage them to be present at the multi-stakeholder dialogue. That is why this week, plastic is nearly all that I am doing because this leadership matters. And meeting with businesses here in New York, which is after all sort of the business, I don't know, center of the world, it seems, uh, is a really good opportunity. But each minister, reach out to your, to your business um, uh, sector and encourage them to come inside not in a defensive mode, but in a co-creative mode. That way we can actually get somewhere. Um, similarly, and this would be my last point, and Espen knows this very well, as done, does Minister Jeanne d'Arc, don't forget the poorest of the poor, the waste pickers. Look, often they are female, often they are impoverished, often they are the primary uh, earner for, for, for their families. And the day we go in with a smart, fancy recycling plant, it's the men who will get the job and the women will be left behind. And these are jobs that are underpinning families. So in coming together on this treaty, we also need to make sure that we don't just say the words, don't leave anyone behind, but then we also follow through on it. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Inger. That is, uh, that, is, um, that is extremely helpful. Also wanted to turn to you, Christine. If you can just be very brief. We just, we're just running out of time. I have so many questions of our list. I don't get to ask them all. So if we can ask you to be brief, that would be, that would be appreciated. No, absolutely. And again, I appreciate it. Just building off of what Inga said, I'll try not to repeat because there's so many thoughts and comments that she made and previous speakers as well. I mean, it is absolutely critical as we're going forward to involve the multi-stakeholder approach. And, and as Inga there at the end was talking about the informal sector, I'll, I'll put in another pledge for that. But again, the public and the private engagement in this is so critical for that total value chain systems um, approach. But also, let's not lose sight and constantly be talking about recycling there's so much that needs to be done upstream and how do we really reconsider our approach and our systems overhauling and so I mean we used to talk about the three R's reduce reuse recycle and I think there's a lot of other R's that we could consider rethink redesign reconsider um, and so it's really how do we create a new approach to our relationship with plastic and looking at this entire all the different actors throughout the value chain and I really I, I do sometimes I really want really want to push that this cannot we cannot recycle our way out of this. We must think about other approaches that embed the circular economy, uh, bringing to light various technologies, innovations, uh, and again, the, the financial tools as well. I mean, we've 
published a finance toolkit, be great to see some uh, additional first movers that we can uh, highlight in, in future future case studies. And then uh, my, I'm, I'm actually leaving here to go launch uh, the business coalition. So really excited to see that we've got the, the government coalition now and the business coalition now in about 10 minutes um, down the road. So there is a great desire from the business side as well as government to, to move this forward. And uh, I would also implore, because we've got two folks on the line, I'd say, you know, what's happening um, in Rwanda in December around the World Circular Economy Forum, you know, another opportunity. It doesn't have to be the formal conversations at the INC for us to pull together these multi-stakeholder discussions. And similarly, uh, UAE hosting COP20, eight next year, uh, let's elevate these conversations and ensure that people understand the connection between climate and plastic pollution and production. And then, uh, and, and I think we can get ourselves to a whole better place. So we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here, Magnus, and, and to engage with all of the panelists. Oh, thank you so much. From uh, it's it's really it's really great to to have you have you taking part in this uh, this discussion. And this will not be the last time we meet to discuss. I'm sure. I would like now to circle back to to you, uh, Minister Ida, for your sort of reflections on the discussion before we move to some concluding remarks uh, from the Minister of Rwanda. Thank you uh, so much, all of you. It has been a, a splendid conversation and a lot of uh, good uh, insights. I want to thank each and every one of you. I also want to echo what Kristen just said. I. I, I already look very much for, forward to Marianne's COP28 when we have to survive 27 first, but I think that's going to be a really promising one with a lot of uh, innovative, uh, innovative ideas and, and one example of a great leader country here and a leader minister just like uh, Rwanda, Canada and others are here. And, and again, uh, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for the help from non-state actors who are here. Uh, Christine, what you are doing in the, the forum is, is really, really appreciated. Uh, it was very high on the agenda in Davos this year. I, I, I have a suspicion that it will be high on the agenda again in January as we, we meet there again. And I think this is really good because there's so much knowledge out there on the business side and so many players. Not everyone, of course, but many key players who really want to be on the on the right side of history and help us governments to to shape this in the, in a good direction. So I want to say that as well. And without echoing all the good things that been said, underline a few keywords: systemic change. Yes, indeed, this is not about incremental improvements. You know, a little bit less, a little bit better bottle. This is really about reimagining the whole our relationship to plastics. Plastic is actually an extremely useful product when it's used correctly and terribly bad if you use it wrong. So it's not about whether you're for or against, it's about using this genius thing, which is uh, everlasting for sort of long lasting uses, which uh, which are meaningful. And then also think about uh, reduce, re reuse and recycle around that and, and, and try to as much as possible get rid of the uses that themselves lend themselves to the leakage that we've seen so much of. So that's a key word. Uh, reg like regulatory measures matter and restraining demand, influencing demand, influencing the economy. And I think we were, it was very convincing what we heard both from Shiran and Agravella about the fact that a circular economy is actually economically, makes economic more sense. But, but, but be aware, it doesn't mean that in a linear economy, if I go circular in my little box, that's not necessarily economically viable for me. So the thing is you have to create that broader framework in, so that the world goes from linear to circular, just as it has to go from fossil to renewable and from you know, non-sustainable to sustainable. Once you're there, the more you, you lock in an economic logic that lends itself to smarter and smarter use of resources. And this is what we're dealing with here. And it, it's across the board. So that goes on product design. It goes to all these issues. I also think the mentioning of trade. I mean, we 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 want an open free trade world, but we're not trading in whatever product. I mean, there are rules and regulations for what kind of stuff you can send over borders. So that's also an instrument to use because if you regulate that on the trade level, it's also less attractive to keep producing those things that you don't want to have around. So also a good reminder on using that instrument in, in a world which I think is more willing to regulate uh, what uh, what should be traded. I mean, uh, in a parallel process that many of us are involved with, we are seeing much stricter regulation now on trade in deforestation products, for instance. That is very helpful. And, and I think the same thing can happen here. And then, of course, while we want a solid treaty, this is why we are together as the 
uh, co-chairs here of this uh, coalition. We also want to leave some room for national innovation and adaptation. And not every country needs to do it in exactly the same way. I mean, uh, uh, Mariam even pointed out internally in the UAE, I mean, some, some Emirates go for fees or they go for bans. So when, as long as you reach the same outcome, I mean, there must be some room for that as well because countries are different. And very final point is remember the social impacts. I think to remember the waste pickers, they were there, present, active in Nairobi. And I think we made a collective commitment not to forget them. So let's uh, let's keep remembering that as we move forward. And also the, the cost uh, picture we got presented, it's not very costly, but it's more costly in some places than in others. And that's also a collective responsibility that we have to bring on. And my final word before I think... Uh, uh, Jean d'Arc takes it from here, is that the coalition is open for new members. If you think you as a government minister or you as a citizen should uh, encourage your countries to join, feel free. But you have to commit to sort of the platform that we have uh, developed. But this, this, the high ambition coalition is only for high ambition governments. Yeah. Uh, but if you are a high ambition government, you're welcome to join us in this club. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, Esben, and uh, all higher ambitious uh, members who were on this call. And uh, these were very insightful discussion. And uh, it shows us on what the road to ending plastic pollution by 2040 is is on our way. So we have had hundreds of people from all corners of the world tuning into this virtual event. And this shows us that uh, ending plastic pollution is a priority, is a priority for no matter where we live, from the shore of the Pacific Ocean to the foothills of volcanoes and the national parks in Rwanda. And of course, I would like to thank my friend and co-chair of this high ambition coalition, Minister Espen, for your continued leadership and for your team's hard work to bring the high ambition coalition to life. And I want to tell uh, people on Rand that uh, charity begins at home. We don't have single use plastic in the, in the mission of Norway here in New York. So we start uh, from our home and uh, we end plastic pollution even in our offices. We say no to plastic. And uh, I want also to thank Inga Anderson. Thank you for your thoughtful contribution on the steps we must take to realize a, a legally binding international treaty. You are absolutely right. We need to run from the past and innovate for the future. As my friend, uh, Minister Espen was saying, we can do differently because we are different countries, provided we have the same outcome. So I, uh, I my thanks go, go to Jason Momoa. Thank you for your leadership and the passion to protect our planet. As you said, let's go to work. Today we have heard from a range of experts from systemic, the OECD, as well as the World Economic Forum and Pegasus Capital Advisors. Thank you for sharing your expertise to develop a strong treaty that matches our ambition. We need data and knowledge. And to World Economic Forum, I want to say that by ending plastic pollution in our nature, we at the same time create green jobs, hence the increase of wealth for our population. 
I also want to thank Minister Gilbert from Canada and Minister Almeri from the UAE for being with us today and demonstrating your commitment to ending plastic pollution. I promise my sister, Minister Mariam, that my next stop from New York will be in UAE to learn how we can have better systems in our communities. The High Ambition Coalition is committed to ending plastic pollution by 2040. And we look forward to expanding the coalition by welcoming new members, as my, my co-chair said. So the 24 nations who have already joined, thank you. Thank you very much. Over the next few years, the coalition will be investing in the research, webinar conversation, and awareness raising we need to achieve a TDT that works for nature and humanity. We hope you will join us on this journey as more as you can. While we only have a short time to finalize the treaty, this is not an excuse to water it down. It is a challenge to make it even more robust and ambitious. I'm confident we are up to the challenge. Finally, I would like to thank Magnus for a spotless moderation. And I would like to encourage everyone, especially federal leaders, to not wait for the treaty to address plastic pollution. Let us all take steps nationally to deal with plastic pollution. And together we can. Once again, thank you for joining us. Together we can end plastic pollution and have a planet worth living. I thank you.